Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight, and thank you to the Rockefeller Center for hosting this conversation, um, which is called Politics in as Performance. I'm Samantha Lazar. I'm the curator of academic programming at the Hopkins Center. And this weekend, the Hop is presenting Christina Wong's one woman show, Christina Wong for Public Office. <laughs> Woo! which is inspired by her campaign and her time as an elected representative of Koreatown in Los Angeles. It is comedic and satirical and kind of disturbing a little bit. Um, and I hope a lot of you are able to make it. It is sold out, but um, if you show up and go on the standby list, you might be able to get in. Um, all right, so Christina Wong is a Pulitzer Prize nominated writer, comedian, performance artist, actor, and elected representative. Christina recently became one of six recipients in the nation of the prestigious Doris Duke Foundation Award for excellence in her field. And her recent work has been a New York Times critic's pick and garnered um, uh, awards including the Drama Desk Award, the Lucille Lortel Award, and the Outer Critics Circle Award. My co-moderator for this conversation is Herschel Nachlis, who is Associate Director and Senior Policy Fellow at the Rockefeller Center, and a professor in the Rockefeller Center and Department of Government. The three of us are going to have a conversation for about 30 minutes or so, and then we will open it up to the audience. And with that, I will pass it off to Herschel. Please applaud. Please clap. Please clap. Please applaud. Wait, Christina, did you know that the infamous Jeb Bush please, please clap incident yes. happened right here yes. in Hanover, New Hampshire? Do Hampton? you know that that happened right here? <laughs> please clap. Yes. So and then he dropped out of the race. And then, and then, <laughs> and then he dropped out of the race. Um, so thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, maybe five or six lightning round questions sure. to start us off. And then uh, turn it over to Sam for deeply substantive questions about uh, uh, theater and performance. Uh, and then we'll see where the conversation goes. So, so to sort of start us off with, with our lightning round, actually, why don't we just start with this? Did you watch the debate last night between uh, Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis? No, I want to see it. Um, it sounds like it was like two siblings. I just read the, I, the quick text, two siblings fighting. <laughs> Is that, that's the headline I read. OK. Um, so so, so <laughs> fair enough. So you describe your work as, quote, subversive, humorous, and endearingly inappropriate. And I'm wondering if you could just start us off with, with an example of, of, of this type of work that you think best exemplifies political humor and performance art. And if in order to do that, you need to, to grab the mic or the podium. Oh, well, if, if, does everyone know who Jeremy Lin is, the basketball player? So Google who is Jeremy Lin's wife. Just Google who is. Like right now? Yeah, who is Jeremy <laughs> Lin's wife? And you'll see that. What are you finding? What are you finding? <laughs> I hear laughter. Who? Who? Anyone? Is, is the internet just that bad here? What's going? Me! It's me! I'm Jeremy <laughs> Lin's wife. Yeah, no ring. Never really have met him in person before. So I, <laughs> so about 10 years ago, I'm 45 now, I, I was at that age, I don't know if, if you are all living with this, this uh, like, oh my God, I'm supposed to get married by 30 and then have a kid by this age and that age, like there's sort of implicitly, I think this timeline that is put in our lives and, and I uh, was not meeting any of the marks on this invisible timeline and here comes Jeremy Lin, this, the, the, Asian, the only Asian American basketball player. And, uh, and I was like, you know, I'm gonna play this anxiety out in public and just publicly love on him and say that I'll be his, I'll marry him. And so I would show up dressed like as a bride at, uh, at like his documentary screenings and I would do interviews with the press. And, uh, and so he actually got married earlier last year and, and people were like, did you see this, Christina? And, and, and I was like, ah! This ruins that whole, this long running joke. Who did he marry? Who did, oh, me, he married me. So I did such a good job of, of documenting this a very obscure marriage performance that AI journalism has reported his wife is me. And it also says I'm worth $5 million. 
and that we live in a mansion together, and that I keep my figure slim by being an actor. So AI <laughs> journalism, AI journalism. But, but yes, yeah, so that's an example to me of a piece that sort of like lives in real life and, um, uh, <laughs> and then becomes recorded as real life. I think it's very interesting that I'm here because I was, I was basically elected on my neighborhood council, which is like the homeroom president. It's like if, you, if, if it's like if, yeah, yeah. I'm basically a home, like homeroom president, and um, I think it's it's really funny that 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 I am being presented to government classes and stuff to speak. But like so much of everything I understand about politics is uh, is is how popularity tactics and. Um, and, and, and theatrics can help get you get elected. Yeah. Funniest politicians or politicians you'd most want to see uh, do performance art? I think I'm witnessing it already. I feel like most of what I, the results of the 2016 election where I was like, oh no, this is, <laughs> like I loved watching those uh, debates. I loved watching, um, you know, what people call the shit showness of it because it felt like, crazy performance art. It felt, it, it, it was like, there's some, there are some people running who are not qualified at all, but just to watch them monologue and justify how their experience makes them qualified is, is kind of hilarious. But now we're living in the aftermath of, um, <laughs> of, of, of them actually getting elected. So, so the, I think for me, that's a lot of the question of what I'm I know this is not lightning round answers. It's not lightning round. But, <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of what we're witnessing is is the aftermath of someone trying to their reality show did not get renewed, and to kind of continue to stay in the public eye, they ran for office, which is a tactic that a lot of people do to sell books, to raise their public profile, um, to push ideas on the public. And uh, in this situation, we actually uh, were under the leadership of this for four years. Least funny politicians or the folks you would least want to see do public performance art. Uh, but uh, I see this. I, I have struggled with all these questions because I feel like all politics is a certain public performance and symbol making. So, um, and I kind of prefer my politicians under the radar, and and I'm not waking up every morning screaming like, "What did you do? What? Who are we? We're at? Who did you just provoke?" So. Um, yeah, I guess in a way I, I, I answer that question with, a, with turning that upside down and going, I don't, I, I, <laughs> I'm already watching the performances and I'm, I'd, I'd rather people just sort of get things done. One thing all politicians complain about is fundraising. Mm -hmm. One thing most artists complain about is, is fundraising. Survival money, yeah. Uh, which of these is better or worse? Which of these is more fun or less fun? Running, running for office, sort of fundraising as a politician, or, or fundraising as a Well, a lot as, of as running artist. for office is, to, is, is about maintaining the momentum to get people excited to give you money so you can keep running. Um, I think the fundraising really sucks. That's, that's rough. Uh, but that's me personally. Some people know people with a lot of money and are able to get them to write those big checks. And part of the reason why I didn't run for a bigger office is because it was just so difficult to figure out how to raise money to to do that, I'll go through that in my show, the, the actual numbers of how much it costs to run for big offices. Last, last one of these random yeah. lightning round things. What was the best part, or what is the best part of being an elected official during your experiences, and I wanna get this right, sub-district five representative of Wilshire Center Koreatown Neighborhood Council yes. in Los Angeles. So the best part of running for office is that no, as it turns out, very little people understand how government is structured, and when I'm introduced as an elected official, I see, the whole temperature of everything shift. People think I have power I don't have. I'm able to shake hands with people I don't, um, I wouldn't get to normally. I, the Congressman Ted Lieu in California, I had met him, uh, I was wearing at a rally, I was wearing like this big hat, this Pope hat that had a like sort of a vagina like shape on it. And I took a photo with him and he's like, um, I wish it to be taking this photo. But then later, when I was an elected official, and I also have the cachet of being this, this artist, too, I was, uh, I was invited to be in a very small Zoom, this is in the pandemic, like Zoom conversation with him. I was like, wow. <laughs> in this very different context, I was able to get in the room with this, this person. So, um, I mean, for better or for worse, I, I, I think it sort of indicates how little we understand, like, uh, uh, how, how, how power is doled out and who can actually get what done. 
Um, but it, it is fun to figure out how to sway, how to take what le power people assume I have and figure out how to sway it, uh, sway cultural ideas around other things with it. Great. Yeah. yeah. Turn it over to Sam. All right. <clears throat> so you, you ran for office and you made a show about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my question is, which came first? Is it like a chicken or, or chicken or the egg? Do they evolve simultaneously? Yes. And, and then adding on to that, like wh where's the line between your life and your art? Uh, none. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, in, in 2015, I had a opportunity to, to pitch a reality television show. Uh, and in the TV world, we call it a pilot. So um, you, you get some money from the network to make just a sample episode which doesn't air, and, um, and, and they decide from that if they want to order it for the entire season. And I thought, you know, this is when Obama was president, and I felt very clear that Hillary was going to be elected. And I also live in California. I live in Los Angeles, and I'm in a, a, a very progressive bubble where I feel comfortable to, to satirize myself as an activist, to, to make fun of other, like the culture of progressiveness, and, um, uh, and, and not in a, like a mean way, but that was the pilot was, it was like Nathan For You meets Michael Moore. If you're familiar with either of them, they're, they both like sort of disrupt real life. And, uh, and I, I was gonna be Christina Wong, this, this like do good activist with these crazy ideas to, to get social justice going. And so um, our pilot episode was there was, this is, in real life there is a gas facility in the northernmost district of LA that um, where people were getting cancer and nosebleeds and because there were these big leaks and explosions at this gas facility and it was about to reopen. And the community that was trying to protest it getting closed down again, people were so exhausted, no one was showing up at these rallies. So my pilot was me getting these Instagram models who have, who have followings because they basically have, they're very shapely, <laughs> they have implants in their backsides and, and they have these like followers and we were, and I was gonna coordinate this meet and greet, meet these Instagram models at City Hall and but with the idea that all these perverts would come meet them <laughs> and then form a crowd and I put rally signs in their hands mm -hmm. and basically galvanize all the perverts to create this big <laughs> rally, right? That's the pilot episode. And, um, and that felt so funny when, when, <laughs> <laughs> when Obama was in office, but suddenly there was a whole culture that shifted uh, when Trump took office and activism was really about life or death survival. The culture of, um, of, 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 it became very clear making fun of myself as an activist. People were not clear if I, that I was making fun of myself, that they really thought I was that dumb and naive. Uh, and I felt like, oh my God, now I'm a liability to the things I care about. And, and this whole thing sort of flipped where, as someone who used to make satire with real life, um, that maybe this doesn't, didn't exist anymore. Artists and politicians seem to have switched jobs. Um, so the pilot didn't get picked up. Um, and I really struggled the whole time as I was making that pilot for various reasons. Uh, one, it just didn't make sense in the world we were suddenly living in, or that we realized we'd been living in the whole time, and maybe we had just, Put, we're just existing in these small bubbles where we thought that, oh, this, this humor totally will make sense to everyone else. Um, I had tried making a play, uh, writing a, a fiction play, sort of satirizing this current crazy moment in politics where, it, 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 where people were very scared. And, um, uh, and, and it, it, I was trying to write an over-the-top character that, that sort of resembled something like Trump, but it was like real life was, was how, how do you out clown like real life uh, when it is almost as absurd, when it's even more absurd. And I just woke up one morning and I was reading about some executive order he had signed, the, uh, I don't know, it was like the Paris Act or you know, just something like that was kind of vital, I think, to our livelihood and staying alive uh, as humanity. And I just was like, ah, oh, I'm just gonna run for office. And then I went, that's it. I'm gonna, maybe because I'm out of a job as a satirist, um, I'll get my, because basically the, 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 the politicians are creating spectacle, uh, I'll go become a politician and create spectacle, spectacle that way, maybe some change. And so, um, 
so yeah, it started with this idea that maybe I'll just run for office and then try to make a show about it. And I had been really fascinated with the rallies uh, I had been watching and how theatrical they were. And I, I watch everything as if it's a show. I watch reality TV. I watch, um, I watch The Apprentice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anyone watched it, but it's really interesting to watch that and, and see how, how uh, a lot of how Trump uh, would communicate sort of patterns, um, the way he talked, except he didn't have a, like a producer there with him, uh, the, the, the way he talked in, in terms of cliffhangers and teasers and unveiling things uh, with this like drama. Um, and, and so I very much had thought, I had known whatever the show was gonna be was gonna look like a rally because I just was so fascinated with how rallies were like these w very weird, a combination between sermon and one person show, right? Where you, you're really trying to get the audience to shift to connect to you as a human being and, and convince them basically to hand you the final rose, right, to, to, in Bachelor speak. Does anyone watch The Bachelor? Just me, too busy studying, yes. Oh, okay, one, two, oh yes. <laughs> the rest of you, come on, stop studying, watch The Bachelor, but. There's a lot to, <laughs> but there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot of similarities between The Bachelor, uh, these reality shows where there's a lot of people trying to get the attention of one person in mm -hmm. politics too. You know? So if if all politics is inherently uh, is inherently performative, mm -hmm. or even if maybe it shouldn't be, do you think all performances is do you think all performance is inherently political? Hmm. <laughs> That's a really interesting question. Yeah, so, so yes, politics I believe is very performative and, and it has to be now, especially mm. if you're in the position of trying to get people's attention. Mm. Um, and polit and I, I, I think I came actually from, I, I was drawn to doing solo work, to writing my own shows um, over sort of the sense of traditional activism, which when I was in college in the late 90s was people chaining themselves to building, getting arrested, uh, getting into these big, deep confrontations. I was like, this is too hard to do all the time. But, but if I sit in a small theater and watch someone of a marginalized identity share stories about their life, I am that much more compelled to, to think about the humanity of everybody of that demographic. Like, I mean, I was uh, acquainted to, um, to, to other people of color, to transgender folks, to queer folks by watching their solo shows. Mm -hmm. And to me, that that connection to them made me more compelled to, to, to fight for the things they, they wanted, you know, support and, and fighting for, whether it's getting, being able to get married, which is something I think we're already beginning to take for granted, right? Which was not a right then. And, um, and so, yeah, so I do think when you put yourself out there, it's a huge thing that people read into, uh, especially as a marginalized body, of forcing someone to consider you, consider your story, and offering them a different narrative than they would expect to come out of your mouth is, is intensely political. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, so talking more about these kind of blurred or blurred identities or multi-dimensional mm -hmm. identities. So you're, you're obviously very funny, but you're not explicitly a comedian. Mm -hmm. um, you are an artist. And you are, or at least were, a, a politician yes. and someone who cares deeply about politics. So how do those identities intersect and coexist in you? Uh, well, <laughs> well, when I, I was, so, okay, I decided to run for office and I go, okay, I'm gonna run for office. I think, you know, you do the big Facebook announcement. Facebook is something that people of my generation use to communicate. and. Uh, and, and, and all these friends got excited for me and I did research about how to run for office. And, and there are a lot of programs um, specifically teaching people of different demographics how to, to run a campaign. And there was one program sponsored by a group called Fractured Atlas called Artist Campaign School. And they specifically want, they, it's, a, it's, an, it's bipartisan, but it is teaching artists how to run for office with the idea that artists, so much public policy affect, uh, affects our funding, how, you know, how much culture is, cultural institutions are valued in our budgets and stuff, with the idea that if artists run for office that we can, can shift public policy towards more support of the arts. And, um, and one of the workshops we did was crafting our campaign speech. And it was, it was like almost the equivalent of a monologue writing class that you would, or playwriting class where um, 
where rather than saying, when I'm elected, I am going to do this, that, this, or that, like just naming a bunch of policies, instead to be like, um, I, I grew up in a one bedroom apartment. Uh, my mother was a single mom. She woke up at uh, 6 a.m. every morning and I remember going uh, down to the garage and saying, mom, do you have to go to work today? And she said, yeah, I do. Like really crafting these like very visual details. Like that was, it was a, it was a very specific kind of storytelling. And wow. <laughs> Sorry. What is that? There's, a, there's an assassination. <laughs> what kind of assassination attempt is this? Anyway, right? <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> Who's throwing their phones? <laughs> Throw less expensive stuff like shoes at me, please. But anyway, um, see, theatrics, theatrics. <laughs> but uh, uh, what was I saying? Um, identity stories. Yes, identity stories. But, but looking, if you look at some of the folks <laughs> who run for office, we don't really remember as much as the stuff that they stand for, as much as like, like Pete Buttigieg talks about the being the gay kid in Indiana, but also um, uh, being a veteran and speaking different languages. Elizabeth Warren tells a story about how her mother, um, uh, when she, she became a widow, the mother was a widow, she takes her one dress from the Sears catalog. And these are very careful, carefully crafted mm -hmm. stories. Um, Obama's former speechwriter went on to write for, for Funny or Die. He's a comedy writer, right? So, so I think that that was really interesting to me. Uh, and then watching Trump's speeches, it was like, we know that he was like this kind of jokey 80s billionaire who hosted a show, but to watch him recraft that story into how he could run um, the US government like a, like, a, like a very successful business, uh, was was like wow this is this is interesting like story crafting that's happening right now, um, and so uh, yeah so that that to me was the most interesting thing was 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 thinking wow this is uh, so thinking about these details that that sort of cue other voters and 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 also that part of rallies where you bring up Joe the plumber or you're bringing up the veteran or you bring up the gold star hero. Uh, and, and if that gold star hero is not alive, you bring their parents, right? Like all these ways to signal to an audience, that, uh, to a voter, that, that, that you are with them. Yeah. Which are very yeah. strategic, yeah. Right. Well, with that, let's shift back to Herschel uh, with these politics, speech, yeah. identity, humor topics. Yeah, just, just a few more questions about sort of uh, politics and identity and speech and, and, and what, it, what it all means in 2024. And then I think, I think we'll open it up to folks. Um, so the first of the two questions is about personal identity. Um, so you began with a, uh, a story about uh, marrying Jeremy Lin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and the short version of this, this question is, 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 is whether, whether you know, I could tell that story. The longer version is something like this. So there are these debates about performance, um, about which people of which identities can tell which jokes and which mm. people of which identities can perform as which characters. So, so I'm Jewish American, you're Chinese American. Mm -hmm. um, and one version of this question is like, so, so am only I allowed to do humor about Jewish people and identity, or can you, or only you, allowed to do humor uh, and performance about Chinese American people, or can I? Um, how does this work with playing folks in, in TV shows Ooh. and theater? <laughs> Little this question. Is, this, is a, this is, yeah, this is a question that has come up a lot, like who's allowed to tell what jokes. I think it's, a lot of it depends on, on how, um, is, is it a joke that is dehumanizing the other group? Because if I'm, <laughs> I think if, if I were to tell the joke about Jewish people, my instinct as a joke writer would be to first establish that like I have a rapport, like you come to my family's restaurant on Christmas day, but the, the, here's the joke about blah, 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 right? Like that would be my instinct versus like, you know those Jews do, and I won't fill in the blank, but you know, <laughs> I, so I think there's a little of that. I think if, if, if I don't feel like there is a rapport or an, a, a real knowledge, and I, if I, um, I think there's also loving humor. Mm -hmm. uh, like I, okay, now you're putting me on the spot, but I feel like, <laughs> I feel like maybe, yeah, they're, they're, if I were to make some similarity jokes about how, how cheap we both are. This, uh, this is not where I would go, but like, I would I would try to establish that rapport first for, versus just stabbing away. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I'll go there. It's a, it's, and it's sort of like, I think it's assessing what is the point I'm making, punch up or punch down? Hmm. And, um, and, and who do I want to win in this scenario? Uh, and for, for, for certain political humor, there are certain issues that I personally care about and certain audiences that I care about more than others. So I'll, t I'll tell, the st I, I tell the story in my show of basically around the time that I um, uh, filed uh, to run, uh, Alex Jones, the right-wing commentator of InfoWars, was coming after me and uh, for a web series I made, which is a satirical web series for kid audience called Radical Cram School. And in that web series, I'm like, it's like a radical Girl Scout group and I have a little beret and stuff, but, but that audience, they don't read the subtleties of activists making fun of themselves. They just see communists. They see an Asian woman with a, a thing and they're just, they're just like coming at me. And um, I'm not concerned with offending that audience. Mm. That's, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to get everyone to like me. And I think, I think that's what we're sort of finding as comedy has shifted and art has shifted and politics has shifted that it's, that there is an audience for being polarizing. It used to be like you never wanted to be the villain, but if you look at reality TV, there are people who ride careers off of being villainous. Um, yeah. That, that's really helpful. Um, yeah. One more question sort of in that vein and then, and then we'll open it up. Um, I'm wondering what you think about this idea that, that, that humor and satire in particular are really the last domains of true free political speech in the United States in the sense that both the the left and the right have engaged in attempted censorship to such a degree that, that free speech is sort of on the decline elsewhere, mm -hmm. and we really only find it in, in, in satire and in performance uh, in humor. And so if, if, as you say, artists are the ultimate hope for, for real social change, uh, are, are we doomed everywhere else, and, and that's our one sort of last salvation? So this is where I was at a few years ago in the pandemic, as I, I just felt like, um, Humor shifted a lot. Uh, all the late night comedians were filming from their homes. Mm -hmm. You couldn't hear laughter. You could hear a laugh track. And, and a lot of the monologues shifted in tone. They were a lot more sincere. The, the, uh, in Colbert's case, it was just his wife in the room laughing at him. And I, I felt like the move is away from, maybe the move is away from satire and joke making, and maybe the innovation is embracing earnestness. And, um, and some of the examples I name uh, in this point, like Dave Chappelle, who has done a lot of things that <laughs> haven't been, have, have come under fire, but he did the, do this uh, show outdoors after George Floyd was murdered, and it was called like Eight Minutes and 10 Seconds, mm -hmm. and, and which was the time that the knee, was approximately that I think it was called, the, how long the uh, Derek Chauvin's knee was on his neck. And, um, and he's just storytelling and talking about it. And, and, and I thought it was really interesting for comedians to, in, in that time of the pandemic, to not be so hyper-focused on making you laugh, but just reflecting and, do, and storytelling a little bit slower. And so, um, and so I've been thinking about that a lot. Like, could that be the more subversive thing is slowing down uh, the, the, uh, what joke structure seems like to just tell a longer story I feel like a lot of comedy is moving out of comedy clubs and for a long time and has moved into theater spaces or um, has moved into TED Talks or just like other sort of formats. And um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's to me, like I don't know what the future of satire is and, and I guess where I, I mean, when we sort of prepared for this call, we, we had this big revelation that some of you were 10 years old when Trump was elected. And so like my baseline for what a politician is, is like a boring old white guy. And you didn't get a boring old white guy. And most <laughs> like you had a very theatrical white guy, orange guy, right? Like <laughs> with a spray tan, right? Uh, who was on, who had no political experience before the fact. And, and, and so your baseline of how you understand Humor is going to be different than what I grew up with, and and everyone's line for what satire is, and what you think is offensive or funny is going to be a, a lot different. And um, and I see this when I'm like on Twitter and trying to understand some of these jokes that I'm like, this is for a, such a small crowd, and I don't I don't think this is all for me. So I don't I don't know what the, how this answers that question, but but I will say, 
on one hand, maybe you know we don't all have to laugh at the same, we're not all laughing at the same thing because we sort of, and there's more spaces for, for different comedians of color to entertain different silos of audiences, but in the other, yeah. Uh, having been trolled by Alex Jones, I realized very quickly, oh, like, yeah, there's, there's, there will not be that one thing for everybody. Should we open it up to uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just stuck on this being, being trolled by Alex Jones. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> more to come in the show, yes. I can talk more about that too, if you all want, but it's not that, in not that interesting. Oh, also, um, Tucker Carlson. <laughs> Tucker Carlson came after me. Why don't so you tell us, tell I, us I'm, just, I'm just collecting them all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, so presumably, oh. when you began as a performance artist, you didn't expect, uh, you know, like political broadcasters on, on Fox News and, 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 and talk radio to be yeah. coming after you as an artist. Like, what is that moment like? And I thought it would get me more followers. <laughs> but it's just like, it just, yeah. And I talk about this in the show is like, there was a time when someone, if someone came after you, like a whole mob would get have your back, but there's like too many things right now to fight for. And there's like, I, no, I don't spend all day on Twitter fighting for people, right? But I think there was a time when it felt like that, that there, you could mobilize help and support in that way. Um, I'll talk about the Tucker Carlson thing, which I think is, is uh, uh, interesting to look at from an art perspective. This is, so th basically, what I posted was a version of a very old joke. Um, and the old joke is, uh, Democrats, we vote on Tuesday. Republicans, you vote on Wednesday. And we know voting day is always Tuesday in this country. And, um, and so on election day in 2016, I put on a red baseball hat and I had a Trump sign behind me and I said, hey guys, I'm coming out for Trump. And I wanna encourage my fellow people of color for Trump to vote for him Wednesday, um, Super Wednesday. And then my <laughs> caption said, you can also vote by text. So, um, <laughs> so this had like no traction that day, which is a dumb, silly joke that, that people have told forever. Uh, but there's a guy named Douglas Mackey, who I guess is in prison right now, um, and he had made a meme using Hillary Clinton's logo, using very professional, like, I'm literally behind my chest of drawers. You can see my chest of drawers <laughs> behind me. This guy, he like, um, you could look at up the Dave Douglas Mackey thing too, if you need to, but um, he, he had, he on 4chan and all those kind of sites had proliferated these memes telling people to vote by text, and there was an actual number you could text, and, um, and it collected like 500 votes. And it, it, had, it specifically had pictures of black voters, had signs in Spanish. And um, so in this whole course of going to jail, he actually brought my name up in court and said, this Democratic comedian, Christina Wong, um, which is not how I identify, by the way, but <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, did the same exact same thing. And so, um, they keep saying I did the exact same thing, but like, no, what you did was a very concerted effort, right? Like it was a, it was a number, uh, you proliferated a, 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 a very passable meme. Like mine, I was so uninspired when I do this, but I've had, you know, Tucker Carlson, all these people ch like challenge and say, why is Wong not in jail um, for doing this exact same thing? And, and it's been uh, kind of, at, at moments it can be kind of scary because I'm just like, hundreds of people coming after me in comments, but um, luckily they're, they're too lazy. I've learned that these, they're, they're not, they, they, there's no parking in my neighborhood. So I think that's why they haven't come for me in person. <laughs> why don't we open it up to folks? Okay. Um, questions from the audience. Oh, and we're supposed to remind you to make sure you use the mic that will come around when there's, you have I a question. A, I saw a hand there. Hi, thank you so much for coming. My name is Ellie and I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit about your background and what inspired you to become an activist and an artist as a woman of color? Sure, um, that's a great question. I, um, I didn't know that what I do for a living now existed when I was in high school. I grew up in San Francisco. I, uh, I thought that most plays in theater were just what the spring play, spring musical was and the fall play was and, um, and they were, all plays uh, written by, like Neil Simon, they're all written by white men, that these plays. And um, there was very open, diverse casting, but I think what I had internalized was in order to, 
to work as an actor, I need an open-minded casting person who can see me as a white person. That the def that the American, the default American is always going to be a white person, and you just have to figure out how to play that. And it wasn't until I got to college and uh, was in classes that that did like for the first time talk about race in very critical ways, and and I realized how much I had internalized um, so much of my own racism had. Um, had had learned had just sort of like my upbringing was was just sort of like this is how much harder it is going to to be in a room just work harder don't try to change the rules just work harder uh, but I think what really changed my life was was watching a lot of artists of color who are creating their own theater work telling their own stories like I said creating this sort of empathy around um, their identities in a way that I never thought of theater as political. Uh, I took a Chicano theater class and learned how farm workers use theater to organize other farm workers. And, uh, and also just sort of hearing the politics of, of, of um, the criticisms that, that, that uh, Latinx people might have of each other of, of being whitewashed or whatever. I'm like, oh my God, that happens in our community too. Like it was like such a small thing but felt so mind blowing that, that, that there was that, the, there were those intersections in our identities. Um, and I, I, what I loved about uh, watching people make their own work as artists was it was like it was it was not work you had to audition for. Like no one could tell you you couldn't do it, you know, except for maybe the theater. <laughs> but like you know, the, the, there was like it felt like there was so much more power, and there were so many, um, and also being acquainted to campus activism and seeing just how stressed. Like I actually had an ulcer my first year of college because I was so. It's it's kind of a lot when you read about just how racist certain structures are and you and, and you experience that and um and having the experience uh which i don't know if it happens to you people of color here now but like when i was a student it would not be uncommon for people to just start trying to greet me in chinese or start to interrogate me about my knowledge of, of china and then make me feel bad that i didn't know about it um uh or also assume that i'd be a good you know, whatever, because I was a nice, quiet Asian person, right? Like, uh, to, to finally, like, like acknowledge how, how, how much I'd been holding in was a lot. And, and, and like, sort of the, the more aggressive activism, which is not how activism always looks, obviously. Uh, <laughs> just like, I was like, this, I can't physically do this. But doing a show, I feel like I sort of take this story and, and, sh and get people to laugh with me and sort of, release it into the world in a way that feels like I've built this community of people who've shown up here versus um, screaming at, at, at this wall that's gonna take quite a while to come down. So I, I think that's sort of what um, propelled me to do it. I also like to joke that uh, I wasn't very successful in therapy. I felt like I was boring my therapist. <laughs> and, and rather than pay someone big bucks to hear me talk about my problems, I could get an audience to pay me, <laughs> listen to me talk about my problems. And, and that, which is not what theater is, by the way. It's therapeutic, but it's not a replacement for therapy. But it did feel like, ah, at least I have get, get more of a response from an audience when I share these stories with them. So somewhere between all that is how this all happened. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, excuse me. Hi, I'm Will. I just have a question. Um, there's the Oscar Wilde phrase that life often mimics art. And you talked about how it's, it pays off to be polarizing in entertainment like in politics. So do you think going into 2024 as we worry about our democracy, it's good that entertainment is becoming more polarizing? Or do you think that that, that entertainment economy, much like the political economy, is dangerous for our democracy? <sighs> well, there's entertainment, right? And then there's art. And, and some entertainment is not meant to be politically challenging or uh, meant to get you to vote a certain way. Like, and, and maybe, so, uh, examples of what I think falls into that is maybe TMZ or gossip paparazzi stuff that's just, or uh, so sometimes there are moments where the Kardashians do political things like, like Kim Kardashian helped get a, a woman's sentence commuted. So I don't know. This is <laughs> but, but um, I, I definitely, um, I think that the, it is great that there are more voices out there, but the risk is that we're not kind of democratically taking in what we're all observing. And so we're sort of, so I know for me, I'm sometimes shocked when I'm like, what, you're gonna join the Illuminati? 
we all know that that's not a legit thing. And I don't personally know someone, it was me watching a video of someone saying they were gonna join the Illuminati and they had mailed in some money and got a certificate. And, and I was like, wow, there's still a world where people <laughs> believe that. But, but yeah, that, um, that, but I, I, th I think it, it is the, the downside of everyone getting a voice is that we sort of pick and choose where we get our information from and we, maybe we're not getting all the information we need to be getting to really make um, the, the you know, smart decisions or to know what is actually happening. That's my thought. But, but as, an, uh, the, as an artist, I will say it's, it feels like a more exciting time because it feels like there's more opportunities. But I, I also very quickly know my audience will not be the entire country. Like it might just be that the small audience watching that small streaming network. I was about to cold call some faculty colleagues, but there were a whole bunch of student hands. So yeah. there were some, some here in front. Hi, I'm Alan. Uh, thank you so much for speaking with us today. I just wanted to know from your personal experience, how big of an impact would you say your art or art in general can have on political issues? That's great. Um, and so, yes, uh, what, what is the impact the art can have on cultural issues? So one of the great uh, anecdotes that, that I had learned in this whole process of trying to figure out how to run for office is, um, is that policy is always gonna be the last thing to move. So for example, gay marriage. Um, uh, gay marriage, by the time it was passed, there were more gay characters, there are gay politicians coming mm -hmm. out. Um, there's just, uh, there was RuPaul's Drag Race. I mean, there was so much gay stuff in culture that, that it almost felt inevitable. Like, why can't they, why can't, why can't queers get married? And, um, and the last thing to fall and change will always be that policy. But culture has to shift in order for everyone to kind of get on board for that last thing of policy to change. So, so I do feel like sometimes you'll just be like, what, how, how do we, <laughs> how are we still here where, you can open carry guns in certain states and like, you know, because in some parts of culture it's been established that like, the, the, that we think that the thinking is like, don't we not want guns on our campus or, you know, whatever, or pot, right? Like marijuana is not, not legal here. Um, but haven't we, you know, moved past that? Why is there giggling? Are you smoking during <laughs> my talk? Are you vaping? That's what you all do now, vape. Or chewing, <laughs> edibling. <laughs> edibling. Anyway, but um, right, like, like sometimes like, the, like it, it takes a whole culture of like going, oh, like it's not like pot just will show up in all this music and, and all our friends with glaucoma were really helped by their marijuana <laughs> and, and maybe we should not put people to, in jail for the rest of their lives because they had a dime bag, right? Like all these things I think have become for the most part pretty clear now, and, but the last thing to, to shift will probably be policy. So. So what have I done as <laughs> culture? I think hope, hopefully kind of um, feeding the dialogue that I care about that would eventually shift policy to me. Like some of the things I care about is, is uh, I think we should be paying teachers as much as we pay police people, right? I think, um, uh, I don't think that teachers should be armed in classrooms. I don't think that that's the tactic around that. Uh, but I, I, I think, uh, we should decriminalize prostitution and, and marijuana. And what will shift that is, is stories, um, the stories that shift around that, that humanize the people that are gonna be the most affected um, when those kind of things are criminalized. Yeah. Right here in the front. Um, I guess I just wanted to ask about how you feel obligation as a performer and you spoke about the relationship between culture and politics and po politics and culture. Um, like, as a performer, do you believe that you have, like, an obligation to sort of, like, be constantly present and, like, be constantly public in your perspective on issues? Like, how do you maintain that idea of, like, privacy and individuality at the same time? Hmm. hmm. Well, what I'm hearing of your question is asking about public space and private space, and there, there are a lot of, that was a little bit of a learning curve for me. My early shows, uh, one was about depression and suicide among Asian American women. Uh, young Asian American college age women have some of the highest rates of depression and suicide in this mm -hmm. country, and so I wrote a show called Wong Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest about it, and that was hard, because it was very hard to write a show about that and it not be 
personal, right? At first I thought I was going to approach it from a very clinical standpoint and research other people, uh, but it very clearly was about like me and my, and, and what I was working through. And, um, and that show, the, premiering that uh, was very difficult because um, I, I, I presented the show under the premise of fiction. This is the only way I could do this without falling apart during the show, where I start the show going, hey everyone, it's Christina Wong. Uh, and this show about depression and suicide, you might be wondering, is it autobiographical? Is it really about you? No, it's fiction. Say it with me, everyone. Fiction. Fiction, yeah, it's all fiction. And, but it clearly wasn't, right? But I, I had to do that to create this kind of barrier because otherwise I feel like I'm just giving people these very painful moments in my life that, well, I may never ever completely reconcile and letting them run with it. Um, so, uh, so, so yes, I think it's important. Like, I think just because I, I think most people sort of perform a version of themselves for a living, I think it's important to have secrets and have things you keep private. For me, a lot of my, my, my relationships I'd like to keep private, um, just so I have something in my life that I don't feel like I'm constantly like pushing out for likes. So I have this like whole dating persona that's public, that I'm like married to Jeremy Lin. I have a whole other relationship no one's gonna find out about. <laughs> but uh, it's really important, you know, like to, to sort of, and, and, and I think politicians are sort of similar in that same position when they have to parade their families out. Mm -hmm. and, and like, do you remember when Ted Cruz would kiss his kids in public and the kids were like, stop it, stop <laughs> it. You know, like, in that, and like these kind of moments are so fascinating to me, right? Is, is that he's trying to have this very scripted, healthy family moment. Kellyanne Conway, when, when Claudia was sort of falling apart in public um, and the way they had to try to figure out how to deal with that, but also the sort of the, the public that does, you know, ostensibly, you think care about a teenager, like don't go, don't go after the kid, right? And so, um, so I think my obligation is to think like, what am I willing to share, and how? And I, I, I do a lot of rewriting, and I think a lot of politicians have to think about how they have to rewrite the story for the public, because like most of those families are not as happy as they seem. Most of them are the kid flinching from their father. <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna project and assume, but. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. It's, 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 it, is, it is constant playwriting, uh, both in real life and on stage. Put your hand there. Yep. As we've seen an increase in censorship in art and just general social expression, both ranging from you know, Trump's reactions to portrayals of him on Saturday Night Live to the transfer of ownership of Twitter, which is like now known as X, which is mm -hmm. debatable whether that's really art or not, but yeah. As we see this increase in censorship specifically around politics, as someone with a foot in both worlds, do you foresee that sort of writing itself naturally, or do you think that's something that's going to continue to grow in a concerning way? The censorship part. Yeah, yeah I, uh, do I see censorship growing? Is that, is that sort of the question? <sighs> see, there's a, there's a word censorship, but I think it's also, the space for understanding consequences and dialogue and hurt. And it's a, it's a big word to say this increase in censorship because I do, I feel like, well, I guess where I'm getting confused is because sometimes censorship is um, used synonymously with cancel culture. Mm -hmm. um, that you can't, you can't do that. And, I, and, and Roxane Gay um, has this great phrase where she calls it consequence culture. It's not so much like, and, and I, I sort of like this idea more of, of if are we, we have the space to tell people to stop, but we don't seem to have a lot of space to have really meaningful conversations about why something is hurtful or what that history is that informs that. And, um, and that is actually something more I feel like, and that to me is what the art space is ideally, is that space where you, that, that last, space of nuance where you can look an audience member in the eye and fail publicly in front of them over the course of a, 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 a theater work and, and, and have a conversation after versus a tweet or something where you can just get really mad and, um, and just go to war with somebody. Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess, yes, I, I do feel like there will be these increasing calls for, for censorship, but I guess I feel like what I would like to see is, is where do we kind of, continue to have space to have conversations. I see a little bit happen on the news when they bring talking heads to kind of explain why something was hurtful, but I don't know how many people are actually watching it or uh, feeling like they can participate too, or they just 
you know, listening to who has been brought on. That's what I got. <laughs> Want to go in the back over here? Hi, yeah, I had just, uh, if I could expand on that question a bit, um, as I'm sure you know, politics was a topic that wasn't much addressed in comedy until the last few decades. And a lot of people recently, like Dave Chappelle, Kathy Griffin, a SNL in their congressional hearing sketch have, have gotten in trouble for touching on topics that many people feel they shouldn't have. So regardless of whether you think that that cancel or, or consequence culture is growing, do you personally believe that there should be a line as to what comedians should not cross or if that line should be reduced? Well, uh, <laughs> this is so hard um, <laughs> because I very much previously worked in the space where I was trying to shift to real life with like, with these theatrics of let me, let's get the Instagram model pervert fans to, to, to create a rally, right? Um, I think in any situation where, where uh, people are gonna start hurting each other, um, that, that feels like a line that shouldn't be crossed. Uh, um, you know, if people physically become in danger, though I feel like maybe that tension already existed in other ways and the, the, the art maybe have fueled it. But yeah, I guess, uh, and this is where like sort of culture will shift policy, right? Is, is Elon Musk is not a politician and yet he owns one of the largest kind of free speech platforms and kind of can set the rules on what is acceptable to post. And he has a huge megaphone and he can say these things that get rebroadcast and have influence. <sighs> I don't know. I think we all need to like go on a retreat where we, <laughs> I don't know, how do we like, just, yeah, yeah, that we get on this, on, on this, yeah, we're all like starting our conversation from different points and, 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 it, and things can feel very aggravated. Um, but yeah, I, I think for the line for me is where things, where people start to move towards violence. Um, Sam, okay. you gotta call on people. Yeah. All right, me, all right. Put your hand really high if your question is burning. <laughs> all right, right here in the front. Oh, wait, hang on. So you talked a little bit about how um, Donald Trump and how it was really interesting that he, he, he kind of changed his story and changed his message. And my parents are from K-Town, they grew up there. And so it was, um, and I know it's a very diverse place. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how you developed both your campaign message as well as your art catering to that very diverse population. Well, I was elected with 72 votes, if you can't <laughs> right for myself. And I was mostly standing outside a rec center waving people in and using my Korean passing face to, uh, to speak um, uh, what like back pocket, I'm Chinese American. <laughs> it was complete pandering. So that's, that's the whole section of the show where I just like, I basically was like, hey, hey, hey. And actually uh, the Korean newspaper ran some article on me in Korean uh, and someone gave me a loose translation that says, I will make you laugh, please vote for me. <laughs> and I just, I, I was like, this could be a bad article, but I'll just print it out and hold this Korean <laughs> language article and wave down, you know, hominies and whatever to come vote for me. So uh, no, I, and I, w I completely witnessed myself um, turn on a dime and just say whatever people needed to hear on the street in that moment to go inside the rec center and vote for me. So yeah, I, I had no ethics in that. <laughs> but I did drag out my, my I, have, I wore my little white suit. Uh, this is a costume, by the way. Uh, and, uh, and I had my, my, my set, which you, which you see in the theater, which was a giant seal to vote for me, and I, I pulled it out. So that was also part of it, was just to create a big spectacle and get people. So it was very, in ways, Trump-esque. It was like, what, 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 what do you want to hear? Like, oh, oh, look at me. Is this, don't I look famous and fun? Like, come on in, right? So that was... That's how I convince diverse people. A little bit of Spanish, a little bit of Bengali. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I got folks to vote for me. Can we go over here in the middle? <clears throat> Hi. 
Hi, my name's Harper. Thank <coughs> you for speaking with us today. Um, you mentioned how activism became life and death after the Trump presidency. And I was wondering how you felt that change your art and your performance. Did you become more wary of what you were saying? Yeah. Or did you feel it more pressing to say what yeah, you wanted absolutely. to say? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the television pilot I was describing was pitched when, which pitched and sold when Obama was president. And by the time we got around to shooting was when Trump took office. And I just remember talking to that Instagram model who was, uh, was from a reality show called Real Chance of Love. Um, and she's, like, she's Asian like me. And, uh, and I, I, was, I was having second thoughts, like, like am I exploiting her? Like, am I, just, I feel like I'm sort of pimping her out. Like, in my mind, in theory, before we pitched this, this seems so funny. And now I just feel like I'm, I'm part of the patriarchy and, uh, <laughs> and, and having her like, you know, seduce the perverts to, to, to uh, you know, so a lot uh, was turning very quickly. And I was like, I don't know of anything that I used to think was so clearly a joke is that anymore. And, and that's when I began to have a, this real crisis of, um, and I, I think even, and I will, I, I'll just say sort of bluntly, I feel like the, the sort of the, the comedians who were able to make fun of themselves, um, like the Michael Scott character in The Office, who says all these like well-meaning but terrible things to the people <laughs> of color in his office. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, there's a few more examples of these like, these white characters who say terrible things. Like I just sort of thought, oh, I'm just sort of that. I'm just sort of this well-meaning activist that that's the joke is saying terrible things. But that doesn't read when you're an Asian woman. You can't like, I, I actually just seem like I'm this stupid because I don't know that people understand that, that I have the capacity to make fun of myself. I'm not enough of the neutral American face that, or the, 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 the default American face that people get this. And, and that's when I began to go, wow, I'm not even allowed to, I can't go there. Uh, <laughs> I can go there for, for a very small audience of very progressive friends in my community in Los Angeles. But, but you know, to the Alex Jones of the world, they, they go, you know, what is this? You're a communist. We're, we're kind of running out of time. Yeah. And I'm wondering if I could enlist your, your brilliance sure. to help out our students with a problem that many of them have. Uh oh. I think we can do this. Student loans. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to make all loans. your student loans go away. <laughs> Come to my show tomorrow. <laughs> Apparently, the hop budget vastly exceeds the Rockefeller Center budget, if you can do that. Um, so, um, so, so a lot of the students in here are, are interested in, in politics and policy. And one consequence of that, I think, is that they end up thinking that they need to take themselves far too seriously at far too young an age. They need to avoid experimentation at all costs. They need to avoid going out on a limb. And so when I tell them, they come, you know, they come to my class and they say, what should I take? What policy and government classes should I take? And I say, go take acting one for the love of God. Yeah. And right. Um, and they're like, no, I got to take this policy. I mean, so, so, so in your experience, maybe you can communicate this to them better than I can. The act of, of, of getting on stage getting in front of people, putting the amazing shows together that you have, um, revealing yourself in a different way and your concerns about a world in, in a different way, um, taking these risks. Um, can you persuade them to, to take acting one instead of yeah. whatever, I'm whatever I'm teaching in the spring? It is so, well, there, uh, we have had actors become politicians. Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. um, notoriously was so good at campaigning because he knew how to look at a camera and talk to voters. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and not that I need you to become Ronald Reagan, but like, <laughs> you know, but the, it, it, there is something to be said about a certain warmth and, um, and whatever that you can project. Uh, but in general, I think it's so much of um, what I find, I, I find politics to be very similar to art making. Art making is about making symbols, uh, and especially social justice art making is about making symbols until they become real life. Hoping that like <laughs> the theoretical theater community that you created in that moment to listen to you takes its way out into the, the world outside that theater, that, that, that warmth goes out there. And, uh, and a lot of policy, whether it's censuring someone symbolically or honoring someone that day, they don't actually get the day, but you know, it's like you're, these are all symbols that, that politicians make. 
Um, Statue of Liberty is a symbol. It says there's, if you, does anyone know what's at the bottom of the Statue of Liberty? What, you know, you. Okay, give us your poor, poor, your tired, tired. huddled masses yearning to breathe free. There's also a line about bring me your homeless. And we don't do any of that. We're so bad at that, right? <laughs> you know, these are just symbols that have built the foundation of this country. You look at the money. Why is there a pyramid on this money, right? Like these are all symbols that stand for values that we're supposed to be executing. So anyway, the point is like, yes, there's so much art making both in politics and, and politics is, is itself its um, and art, art making is politics and politics is art making. Uh, but I think it's good to, to just, uh, I went to a fundraiser for someone running for Congress and his fundraiser was so cool because he, he used to do musical theater. And so he like sang songs, <laughs> but also gave these incredible speeches where he brought his mother up and it almost felt like his mother was like, uh, was like the sidekick. Um, because he's, he's Iranian and, and like the mother was like, and, and it, was, it was just like, and then, and then Titus Burgess showed up and started singing. <laughs> and I was like, this is how you do a fundraiser. <laughs> sing, so learn to sing, then run for office, look at a camera in a warm way, but no, I, <laughs> it all feeds you, it all makes you human. Uh, and that's so much ultimately why you'd be in working in public policy to, 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 to support other humans, right? Unless you're running to steal. <laughs> which is something that also happens. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Yeah. Thank you. All right, please, please applaud. Please clap. <laughs>